Velkommen alle sammen, the hero from the Viking Age that I by far get the most requests to do a video on is Harald Haldrada. I don't know why, I mean he was cool and all, but he's not even in my top 10 favorite Vikings uh, of all time. There are way more cool heroes than him, but people seem to like him and uh, they know of a very famous story that he was involved in, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, and I'm going to tell you the whole thing and break it down. But uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you some things that you don't know about him as well and about about his journeys in other parts of Europe. Uh, first of all, it's going to be surprising uh, to most people, but he was a Christian. Uh, now this was an interesting time in Scandinavia. Starting in the year 1000, about most of the kings were baptized and they were written down in the history books as Christian, but most of them really were not at this time. And I only say this because the mainstream history books that you read are full of crap <laughs> as usual, but if you look into the actual primary sources and put two and two together, you will see that many of these kings um, and definitely the people of the time were pagan uh, in Scandinavia. Look, I have no problem with Christians. I have many Christian friends today and they're great people. I only say these things because I have a problem with history books and even people with PhDs in a subject spreading absolute lies and I'll come back to this later on in the store but yeah I don't care what religion anyone is as long as you're a good person that being said many Christian rulers in the Viking Age were not good people they were horrible but fortunately Harald Hydrada was one of the good ones uh, and all the evidence suggests that he was clearly Christian same thing as his older half-brother Olav the Saint lots of records of this and uh, that the two brothers here even though many of their warriors were still pagan and believed in reincarnation uh, Olav and Harald Hydrada were clearly Christian and this brings us to the first major event in Harald Hadrada's life, the uh, Christian forces led by his older brother Olav the Saint. They had a Christian army and basically trying to give a last stand to take control of Norway back. The pagan Norwegian warriors were led by Hoyek, uh, Tore Hyn, uh, Kalfar Arnarsson. Uh, some of these are real heroes and they were a much larger army and they slaughtered all of the Saints forces and Norway remained under the Danish king Knut the Great's rule at the time. The Norwegians preferred the rule of Knut uh, from Denmark because he was still pagan or at least had pagan sympathy. Yeah, blah blah blah, he was baptized and he was a Christian king of England. He, he was pagan, trust me. It's too long to go over in this video, but he was. Anyway, Harald Hydrada actually survived this battle, but he was not welcome in Norway after his older brother had done such things to piss off the country. So he was exiled from Norway, and he ended up going east, actually. And he spent time with the Kievan Rus, uh, which was in, a, in an area called Galdariki in the Norse sagas, so basically Russia. He served there under the Prince Yaroslav of Kiev. Uh, in one source, it said that he was welcomed warmly already before he even got there because he had another brother that had previously been there and was good friends with Yaroslav. And his wife was actually a distant relative of Harald Hydrada. This is actually kind of similar to the plot in uh, Vikings when Ivar was in Kiev. Anyway, there Harald quickly achieved a high ranking in just a few years and moved on to Constantinople. He was only 19 years old by that time, so kings and noblemen and heroes were always said to be very tall and strong in the Norse sagas and great warriors. They were typically said to be a head taller than regular men, making them probably about two meters tall at the time. Average heights in the rest of Europe were even shorter than in Scandinavia, so it's easy to see how a giant 19-year-old kid like Harald got to be such a successful warrior when he was so young. Now, I already know what people are going to say in the comments, people bragging about their height, saying they descend from Viking kings. Look, Viking kings were said to be tall, strong, and athletic. Uh, Harald Hadrada, for example, was said to be so strong and uh, great at uh, poetry and sports such as horse riding, swimming, skiing, shooting, rowing. The sagas that mention him in the Mediterranean, uh, he was said to take at least one break during the siege of uh, castles so that he and his warriors could play sports as a break from the battle. Okay, so if you're seven foot tall, and the only thing strong and athletic about you is your left thumb on the joystick. 
<laughs> Probably no king DNA in there, okay? If you can't deadlift an easy 200 kilos or can't even strap two skis to your feet without falling over, nobody wants to hear in the comments section how your ancestors were Viking kings or your Heil Heidelberg reincarnated. Anyway, Heidelberg's big, strong, young badass moved on to Constantinople and he rose to the top of the ranks there in the Vigarian Guard. Now the tales go that it was the Swedes who were typically the ones who traveled east and served in the Vigarian Guard for a long time. And here comes the first Norwegian to the place and says, Bitch, <laughs> get out of my way. Let me show you Swedes how it's really done. So he was massively successful and he was loved by the Eastern Roman Emperor Michael IV. And he was actually made a commander of the military forces, not just guarding the emperor like like the Swedish Vikings did at the time, but he and his men were so good at combat that they went on all of these conquests and traveled everywhere in the Mediterranean and fighting battles and all those things. Uh, many of them, it was defending the Eastern Roman Empire from attacks from the Arabs and reclaiming territories for uh, the Christian Roman Empire. According to one skaldic poem, uh, he captured up to 80 Arab strongholds and won them back for the Holy Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire at the time. So there are many stories about his deeds, uh, what he did in the Mediterranean, he achieved a legendary reputation and also extremely large wealth too long to go into here and you guys probably want to hear about the Battle of Stamford Bridge so I'm getting to that now. Now the Emperor Michael IV died and there was some turmoil here in the Empire so different sources say different things but Heidel was eventually arrested, some say for murder, some say for betraying the new Roman Empire Michael V. Uh, some say he defiled a noblewoman. <laughs> you can read these sources yourself and see what you believe. Either way, he got the hell out of Constantinople and made his way back to Scandinavia. Uh, he headed back to Scandinavia with the goal of retaking the throne of Norway. And this was in the year 1046. He was only about 30 years old at the time. So the king in Norway right now was Magnus the Good. And he was... Yeah, a bit of a pussy in comparison, but he was just a kid after all. He took the throne at only 11 years old, and he was actually a son of Ura of the Saints. So, Magnus was Harald's nephew, actually. And by the time the powerful Harald Hydrada came back to Norway, King Magnus was only about 21, 22 years old at the time. Also at the time, the Danish Svein Estridsson was uh, teaming up with Harald Hydrada and raiding and causing problems in Denmark and along the southern coast of Norway. And the young Magnus did not want to fight these guys, he did not want to take on his own uncle in a war. So he gave up control of Norway and Magnus and Harald ended up splitting the rule and the wealth of Norway. Uh, but just a year later, the young Magnus mysteriously died. We don't know how, but it sounds like an assassination to me, maybe some poisoning. So it was the year 1047 when the great Harald Hydrada took over the throne of all Norway. And this was a relatively peaceful time in Norway. There were a few revolts, but uh, Harald had to exercise his force, but no big battles, and it was relatively peaceful for about 20 years. This brings us to the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which is the whole reason you guys wanted me to make this video in the first place. The throne of England at the time was very unsteady. We had Harald Goodwinson, not to be confused with Harald, but Harold was the king in England, and there were many that felt that he did not have a right to the throne. One of them was Edward the Confessor, who uh, just recently died, and he was a king of Wessex, and this guy was basically scared of invasions and revolt from Scandinavia and Normandy, and he went around promising all these different kings that they would get the throne once he had died. Just be patient, everybody. Wait a little bit longer and you'll be the one in charge. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, he dies and leaves everyone else with a shitstorm to deal with because he was a coward. Man, it's like I say all the time, nothing changes. Anyway, another person who didn't want the English king, Harold, to have the throne was his own brother, Tustig Godwinson. And what he did was pledge his allegiance to Harald Haidrada and invited him to come to England and claim the throne. Throne. And Harald says, all right, 
Don't mind if I do, thank you sir, I always liked England. <laughs> so we had at least two treacherous English kings here, and even more earls. Uh, we had two Scandinavian kings, and one Norman Duke, William, which were, they were really Vikings too. Just a couple generations separated, and they all had plans to come and take the throne of England from poor King Harald. The poor guy, I feel so bad for him, and you're gonna see why in a minute. So the first attackers were, of course, Harald Hydrada and the Norwegians. And they assembled their forces and sailed on over. They made a couple pit stops in the Scottish Isles, which were inhabited by Vikings, and they took a couple thousand warriors from there to help them, and they took another pit stop in Dunfermline and Scotland, and some of the allies of the treacherous Tostig Godwinson were there, so they got a couple more thousand soldiers there. Massive army, about 10 to 15,000 uh, total, we think. So they raided a few places in Northumbria, but they did not receive much resistance. The first real battle came at Fulford, with a resistance from the earls in Northumbria and Mercia. But Harald Hyderada uh, won the battle and captured York pretty easily. Now the English king Harold hears of this and he rushes to the north to fight off the invading Viking army. So the Norwegian ships were stationed right here at Rickhull as it was called. Uh, the next day they, after they had won the battle they were set to meet some of the noblemen from York and they were meeting at Stamford Bridge to decide who would rule over the York on Harald's behalf. So they walked to the bridge with no armor, didn't even bring their full force, it was just kind of a, a peace talk. It was supposed to be just a diplomatic meeting. Now right at this time during the peace talk, he sees the English King Harold's army coming in fully armored and equipped and outnumbering the Norwegians and they said, oh shit. So Harald and Tostig went out to the center of the battlefield to have a chat with the English forces and they saw one lone rider coming out to meet them. And the lone rider said that Tusti would be offered his earldom back if they surrendered. And then the Norwegian king Harald asks, well, what about me? What do I get? And the lone rider on the horse said, six feet of English soil, or perhaps a bit more since you are taller than most men, implying that he would give them no peace terms to the Norwegians, only death and burial. So as the other lone rider rode away, Harald asked who that was, and Tusti said, that was my brother, King Harold, and they were both impressed at the bravery and courage that the English king showed coming out to meet them alone. One of my favorite kings ever, the English King Harold was. Anyway, the battle starts and the Norwegians knew they were fucked, so they retreated over the bridge to buy some time, get ready, and form a shield wall with the little uh, protection and weapons that they had. Meanwhile, the story goes that you've all heard of a giant man stood on the bridge and held off the entire English army for a long time and killed 40 Englishmen with his axe. Now, of course, this story is probably over-exaggerated. I'm sure he had some help. But either way, this man must have been a beast. Think about it. King Harald was probably two meters tall. This Viking on the bridge would have been even more than that. And he was only beaten when an English soldier floated underneath the bridge and stabbed him underneath up the ass with a spear. How do you like that for a surprise sneak attack? <laughs> so the English made it over the bridge and the Norwegians had little time to prepare but they were still outnumbered and without their armor and without a large part of their forces actually. So they were defeated. Uh, but they did put up a hard fight and King Hadel was said to go out in a blaze of glory fighting aggressively in a berserker like state, uh, which is interesting because he was Christian and berserkers were absolutely outlawed in Scandinavia by this time. So don't know if that's true, but he was for sure a beast. He was 51 years old at the time and he got an arrow to the throat and was eventually killed. Towards the end of the battle, the remaining Norwegian forces had come from the ships but they had sprinted the whole way and were tired. It was about 15 miles, so they almost won back control of the battle now that they were fully armored and had their weapons with them, uh, but they were defeated too and they had to flee, and that was the end of the battle and the story of Harald Hydrada. So this is such a significant battle in history because it could have had a huge influence on Europe and really the world. Think about how influential England was for the next couple hundreds of years. Imagine if the Norwegians had one control, what would have been different? And how would that have affected the world? Instead, what happened is, a few weeks later, poor, 
poor English King Harold had to defend another massive invasion by the Normans, who of course took the victory and gained control of England, and everything turned into the history and the world as we know it today. The Normans were also Viking genetics, as I said before, but their culture was much different and integrated into mainland Europe, but there was still Viking DNA in there just back a couple generations. So I continue this story where I speak about Saedit and war magic if you want to watch that video. So that's it for the story of Hayal Hadrada. I hope you learned a couple new things at least, but that's all I'll say for today. We see us next time.